Let's talk about five basic facts about water baptism. Now, this is a Christian tradition that's been around for over 2,000 years, but maybe you're a brand new Christian or you've been a Christian for a while and you just don't really fully understand what water baptism is about or it seems just a little weird to you. So here are five things every Christian should know about it. Number one, water baptism is God's idea. You know, again, it seems a little strange maybe, uh, maybe to think, you know, why would we need to do something like that? It, it seems so out of the ordinary to be immersed in water. I mean, that's what baptism is, is you're being immersed in water and you're coming up out of the water. It seems like kind of a strange ritual, but it was God's idea in the first place. In fact, Jesus himself commanded that his disciples, whenever they invited someone to pursue God and that person would say, I want to do it, I want to become a Christian, Jesus said those people should be baptized. Matthew 28, it says this, Jesus speaking, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So baptism in water was God's idea. Jesus talked about it himself while he was on the earth. So that should catch our attention and should make us want to learn a little bit more about it. So here's the second fact. Water baptism doesn't save anyone. You know, Jesus commanded that we be baptized if we're going to pursue God, but he also makes it clear throughout the word, throughout the Bible, that it is not a ritual that saves anybody. So don't get that confused. Maybe you've heard about that. Some churches might teach this, that you have to be baptized in water, and that's one of the things that you need to do if you want to be accepted by God. And if you don't check that one off, then, then sorry, God won't accept you. And then there are some other things you have to check off as well or God won't accept you. And that's just not the way it works. The Bible makes it very clear that the way we are saved, the way we start a relationship with God is by trusting in Jesus for our salvation. And so there's nothing that we can do that can save us. So water baptism is important. And even 2000 years later, we should understand it and we should do it. But it's not the level of importance that some people might teach. It's not something you have to do to be saved. Well, then why would you need to do it? And that's the next fact. Baptism is an act of practical obedience. See, as Christians, when we come to faith in Christ and we're saved by grace and we become children of God, the next thing that we do is we say, well, how can I honor you in my life, God? You know, and so baptism is one of those really practical sort of almost first steps where God says, well, here's a practical thing you can do. You should be baptized in water. And so Water baptism is one of those initial signs of practical obedience. It's showing to God, it's demonstrating to God, hey, I'm willing to come to you on your terms, not just on my terms. You know, if God asked us to, you know, grow a beard, I'd grow a beard. It, it doesn't say that in the Bible, though. If God said that you've got to grow your hair out really long, I would have done that. Or if God says you've got to wear certain clothes or whatever, it doesn't say any of those things. But it does say, on, on, on just a real practical point, that you should get baptized in water. And so I say, okay, if God wants me to do that, I'll do that. So today, God wants me to be baptized, and tomorrow, there'll be more for me to obey. Here's the fourth fact. Baptism identifies us with Christ and the church. So that's sort of the significance of this ritual. When we're, when we're being baptized, we're, we're identifying ourselves with Christ. So we're saying, you know, Jesus, when he died and rose again, a baptism, water baptism is a symbol of that. We'll see that in the next fact. But we're identifying ourselves with Christ. We're saying, I want to follow you, Jesus. But, but more than that, we're also identifying ourselves with his church, the body of Christ, you know, God's people. Now, maybe it's a local church that you're a part of. That certainly is a part of it. But even in a broader sense, it's the entire church. Every person who's ever put their faith in Christ in the history of the world you and I are a part of that, and water baptism identifies us with the church and with Christ. Romans 6 says it like this, Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? So see, in that verse, we see two things. We're identifying with Christ and his death, but we're also identifying with one another because notice the word, we we were baptized. We were baptized. We. So it's a group thing. It's a community thing. It's, it's, part of, it's part of identifying with the church at large. And here's the last fact. Baptism is a symbol of our new life. So we have this new life in Christ, and, and that's the, the beautiful symbolism of baptism. We go down into the water, and that symbolizes death to our old way of living. And we come up out of the water, and that symbolizes life, a new kind of living now. 
that we live to honor God from here on out. Romans 6 says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So bottom line, baptism is important. And if you're a pursuer of God and you haven't been baptized, you should certainly talk about it and do it. So, welcome. Welcome to First Central Online, and happy Mother's Day. I pray that this is a special day for you. Um, As mothers, we miss all of our mothers, and we look forward to the day that we get to meet with you and with everyone here again. And we pray that this is a special day for you and your family, and a day of worship in the Lord. And you notice that today, we are in a baptismal, and so we're having a baptism. You know, before Jesus went to be with the Father, he told his disciples this. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And today we or with Destiny, our friend and sister in Christ, who wants to make a public profession of her faith in Jesus. And so we're going to spend a couple minutes looking at a testimony um, that we recorded where she's going to be talking about her relationship with Jesus. My name is Destiny LeBron, and Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Okay, you ready? Okay. I'm going. We're we're here. We're doing it. (laughs) All right. So, hi, my name is Destiny, and I'm I'm a follower of Jesus. As a child, I grew up in a Catholic family who believed in God and always taught us about God, but we wasn't really churchgoers. I can't say I didn't. I was kind of following Jesus, but not completely pursuing Jesus. There was an incident in my life where I felt like I had to pursue it, where I couldn't just just pray. Like there was more. Um, I got into a really bad car accident in 2009. I blacked out. But when I blacked out, I was I was in. Please, please, just I pray everything's gonna be okay. And I broke the hardest bone to break in your body, my femur. And there was a bus of nurses that drove by it and stopped, and they all came out and helped us. That's that's not normal. That doesn't normally happen. So I woke up in the hospital. Then when I came to it, all the, you know, drugs and and they did the surgery, you know, the morphine and stuff. I walked and all the nurses were so surprised and I walked like it was nothing. And that was a huge miracle for me. Like he really showed me like, dude, I'm really here. Like I hear you, you know? And, And that was just an eye opener, like, I need to pursue this because he's there, he's watching over me. Since me trusting in Jesus, I think my life has changed, like my heart has changed. I have to say though, it is kind of hard because of where I'm from. I'm not, I'm not from the calm parts, like I'm, I'm from Bronx, New York, I'm from the hood, I'm from the, the nitty gritty, you know learning going through the bible and everything i see that the things that he does want me to ch- like change up kind of i do need more patience <laughs> but um I, I pray for that every day because i have two kids it's, it's a lot i'm so grateful that he still loves me so i i want to be baptized to show everyone that i'm pursuing jesus i'm pursuing his path um i want to go with his journey but I'm also doing it for my bond with him me being baptized is me showing him my dedication to him me me growing in our bond and and our relationship and and 
me being obedient to show him how much I appreciate everything, everything, you know? Like, I'm, I'm for you, and I will show everybody. <laughs> My name is Destiny, and I want everyone to know that I'm following Jesus. So, we're here to baptize Destiny LeBron. And what I'd like to do is have Lois, if you could come forward and just read for us Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to death to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Thank you. And so we see in baptism, we have this symbol, that's a proclamation of our faith in Jesus, but it's also this outward symbol of an inward reality that you have been saved through faith in Jesus. And that's an inside thing that Jesus does. And so, as an outside thing, we show that to the world. And is it your testimony that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes, he is. And is it your testimony that you want to live for him and follow him the whole of your life? Yes, always. Okay. Thank you. Well then, in obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, and because of your public profession of faith in him, it's my pleasure, my sister in Christ, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in the newness of life. Thank you so much. <laughs> Simka, can you come and pray for Destiny? Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for Destiny, for her profession of faith. I thank you for her love for you and her desire to follow you. I'm so, so um, glad that I've been part of this journey and, and um, it's been exciting to watch her grow. And I just pray that you continue to grow her and um, lead her and help her to remain faithful as she walks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Alas, and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? Save my sight. 
myself away Tis all that I can do At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Hey, we're the Wills. I'm Tyler. And I'm Maddie. I'm Jill. I'm Michael. And I'm Noah. We just wanted to give you guys an update from Kenya. We're here at Rift Valley Academy, a sporting school for missionary kids, uh, where we disciple and educate students, thereby enabling their families to bring the gospel all over the continent of Africa. Um, we decided to enter them two, two weeks early back in March, and we had about a few days to get 300 students back to 27 different countries. Um, which was quite an undertaking, but God was so gracious and we were able to get every student home safely to their parents, um, some within just minutes of the borders closing. So, Once we had the students out of here, we had to decide uh, whether we should head back to our passport countries. Uh, the U.S. Embassy suggested that we jump on any flights that we can because they weren't sure that they could guarantee any other flights going out in the future. And sure enough, they did shut down the borders. But some staff did decide to leave and many of us decided to stay. Um, COVID-19 is going to look a little different here in Kenya than it has in the industrialized nations. Uh, we don't really have the healthcare system um, and ventilators and things. We only have 200 something ventilators in the entire country, which is less than Vanderbilt has in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, also, we just don't have the judicial system to keep up with the unrest and peace uh, that can occur during times like this. But we are confident that God is going to watch over us. Also, uh, RVA decided to go online term three with their classes in order to continue to serve our families uh, and students. And so we've been putting a lot of time into figuring out how to do RVA online. Part of that challenge is trying to continue to meet the emotional and spiritual needs of our students as well. So our plan was to have a home assignment at the end of this term, which is mid-July through December, so we can connect with our supporters back in the States. So as of now, that's still the plan. But you can pray for discernment um, if things do ramp up here in Kenya and the um, airlines open again. We just want to know if we should head back a little earlier than we planned. Um, you can also just be praying protection for our missionary families and just have opportunities to share the hope of Jesus during this time of need. Um, also, a lot of these kids that would be boarding right now get to be home with their parents. And so I just pray that they'll have meaningful connections. Um, amongst these missionary families and just for all of us just that we would have our peace and security in Christ and not in circumstances around us so anyway thanks for caring about us um, we appreciate you guys so much and your support we love you and we hope to be able to connect in person uh, this fall Lord willing thanks thank you Oh, mm -hmm. 
words aren't enough to tell if your love is always you. When I'm weary and dry and wondering why there's always you. Hey, good morning, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Obviously, this is a very uh, special day, uh, Mother's Day, where we have the opportunity to uh, think about our, the, the moms, uh, the women in our life who have had an impact on us. I would encourage you to uh, follow the commands of Scripture, to honor your mother and father. If your uh, mom is alive, uh, give her a call today. If you can't visit her, obviously, if with the distancing uh, Requirements, uh, maybe try to do FaceTime, Skype, a Zoom, uh, have a conversation with her and say thank you for her impact on your life. 
if your mom is no longer living, such as my mom who passed away, you know, 15 some years ago. Think about her impact on you and uh, thank God for who she was. If you had a difficult relationship with your mother, at least thank God that uh, she gave you life and you can still think about how to honor the, the one who had an impact on your life. This is also a very special day as we've celebrated baptism uh, this morning and heard uh, Destiny's testimony and had the opportunity to pray with and for her. And so it's a very great day, but we also want to look at God's word to see what do the scriptures say to our lives and how we can live in light of what scripture says. So let me pray for us before we come to our study this morning. So let's pray together. Father, thanks so much for the opportunity that we have to be able to gather in your presence, to worship you, to exalt you. We want to lift you up today. Father, thank you for the women in our lives, for our mothers and the impact that they've had uh, on us and in us, for how they helped to bring us to life, how they helped shape our character, for the lessons that we learned from them. Father, thank you for them. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts today, that we might hear from you to learn how we can Learn to be content in any and every situation. And Father, I pray that you would guide and direct our study this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you think about the, uh, the phrase, if only, how would you complete that phrase? If only I had. If only I had not. If only they had, if only they had not, if only I had a job, if only I had a better job, if only I had a boyfriend, a girlfriend, if only I had a, a husband, a wife, a better husband, a better wife, if only I had not gotten angry. If only I had not made that mistake. If only I had not bought that car, that stock, made that decision. If only they had encouraged me. If only they had supported me. If only they had believed in me. If only they had not criticized me. If only they had not fired me. You see, those two words, if only, are the starting words for unfulfilled expectations and nagging regrets. If you start playing the if only game, it will lead to all kinds of disappointment. In his book, The Finale, Calvin Miller made this statement. He said, the earth is poor because her fortune is buried in the sky and all her treasure maps are of the earth. It's the idea that many of us look in the wrong location for satisfaction. We, we look opposite of where we should be looking. See, the, the truth is, is that reality oftentimes doesn't meet our expectations. Sometimes we have very high expectations, sometimes we very, have very low expectations, but it doesn't map, match up with reality. And the farther apart that gap, the more we begin to experience life in the key of D, where what happens is we get disappointed. Oh, I, I had hoped that this pandemic would be over by now. I would be back to work. I would be with my mother today. I'm disappointed that it didn't happen. We become discouraged. Why try? Why, why make an effort? Because I'm just going to fail. It, it's not going to work out. We become disillusioned. We have this idea of what reality will be, what life will be like. It didn't turn out that way. Oh, man, I'm disillusioned. I, I believed. And look where it got me. And eventually, if we keep going down that road, we can wind up with despair we can begin to think that life is not worth living. I might as well take my life because life is such 
a, a pain right now. See, what happens when you play the if-only game is that no matter what we have, it just isn't enough. There's always something more, bigger, faster, more pretty, shinier, better, and it's just not enough. Regardless of the quality, it could always be better. We begin to criticize and nitpick every decision, every event, every choice, because it's just not quite good enough. It's kind of like Goldilocks and the, and the three bears, you know, it's just not right. It could be better. And the reality is we can become so driven to have the best, to be the best, that we just can't appreciate where we are, what we have as a result of that. And it's in this arena that the Apostle Paul makes a very surprising statement where Paul said, I have learned to be content. And you read that statement and you think, what in the world is Paul talking about? What is contentment and how do you be content and how in the world could he ever make a statement like that? Well, that statement is found in Philippians chapter 4 in the middle of verses 10 through 13. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me there this morning. Listen as I read it from the English Standard Version. And then we'll come back and talk about what contentment is, what it's not. And we'll unpack this passage to see how can we learn to be content? So Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Paul said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking in, of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Well, what is contentment? Oftentimes we define something by saying what it's not to begin with. And the first thing we need to understand is that contentment is not fatalism. Eeyore is not the poster child for contentment. The idea that, oh, life is going to be bad, so I may as well get used to it. The, the uh, lockdown isn't going to end until December, so I may as well go along with it. That's not contentment. That's just a fatalistic attitude. Contentment is not a, an acquiescent that stops us from trying to get better. You don't go to a Fenway Park or Gillette Stadium or the TD Bank Garden and, and see foam rubber hands that say, hey, we're number three. That's not contentment. That's not settling for not improving. That's, that's not what contentment is. Contentment is not a celebration of mediocrity. Hey, I'm average, woohoo! I'm, I'm just good enough. That's not contentment either. A few weeks back, we were having a, a conversation with our son-in-law, Andrew, who lives in New Zealand. And he was telling us about the tall poppy syndrome that the people of New Zealand have to fight against. It's the idea that if you stand out above everyone else, that you soon get removed because they don't want a tall poppy. And it's the idea that people settle for average rather than looking too good. That's not contentment either. That's a complacency, settling for mediocrity. See, what contentment is, is that it is the ability to be satisfied with what God provides in any and every situation. It's the idea that we try to improve, that we try to grow, but then whatever God provides, we say, that's enough. I, I, I can live with that. That's good. It's the ability to be satisfied with what God provides in any and every situation. 
Jim Elliott once uh, wrote a note to his wife Elizabeth. Jim Elliott was a missionary who was martyred in the jungles of Ecuador in the late 1950s. And he once said that, let not our longing slay the appetite of our living. We accept and thank God for what is given, not allowing the what is not given to spoil it. See, what oftentimes happens is we complain about what we don't have, and we never enjoy what we do have. And the what is not given winds up spoiling what is given, because we have the wrong perspective about that. If you looked at the word contentment or content or contented in the Greek language, what you discover is there's a word group and it's translated in several different ways. One is the idea that it is sufficient. It's an adjective. There's the idea of a sufficiency of means, a, a competence, that idea. It's the idea of being self-sufficient in the sense of being satisfied. The uh, Stoics, the Greek philosophy of Stoicism, took this idea that it was the ability to be content and it became the essence of all the virtues. The problem was is that the Stoics took it to the extreme of the idea of being independent of all people and all things. I don't need you, I don't need anything because I am enough. And they took contentment to the extreme and misused it in that sense. In the New Testament, the word group is used in five different passages. And what you discover is that it means an attitude of mind which is satisfied with what's available. It is a calm acceptance of life's pressures. It is the ability to say it's enough. See, it appears in five different passages, Philippians 4 being one of those, but in the other four passages, what you see is that in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, John the Baptist tells the Roman centurions to be content with their wages. In Hebrews chapter 13, which we studied a few months back in our study of that book, in Hebrews 13, 5, it talks about being content with our possessions. Benjamin Franklin once made the statement that contentment makes poor men rich, while discontent makes rich men poor. Well, in 1 Timothy, 3, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 10, it presents the idea that we should be content with having our basic needs met. That is, having a place to live, having food on the table. The fourth passage, we'll see in a minute, but C.H. Spurgeon, the great preacher of London of a previous generation, was given the tour of a beautiful, opulent mansion. And at the end of the tour, the host asked him, well, did you like the mansion? And Spurgeon said, these are the things that make dying hard because we get so enamored and want to hold on to what we have. Well, the fourth passage about contentment is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. It talks about Paul's thorn in the flesh, how he begged God to take it away. And God said no three different times. And he said his grace is enough, which is that same word for sufficient or content. And it's the idea that we should be content with our weaknesses. When was the last time that you thanked God for putting you together the way he did with your strengths and with your weaknesses. See, there is nothing wrong with wanting more money, a better job, more possessions, better health, a better house, a different house, a nicer house, better food. There's nothing wrong with wanting to take mom out for brunch on Mother's Day. The problem is, None of these things satisfy us because no matter how much money we have, how much stuff we have, how healthy we are, what kind of a house we live in, what food is on the table, we always want more. 
It's like having a meal of Chinese food. 30 minutes later, you're hungry again. You want more. It's never quite enough. John D. Rockefeller was once asked the question, how much does it take to satisfy a man? And with rare wisdom, he said, a little bit more than he has. See, there's nothing wrong with those things, but they don't satisfy. More money will not make you content. Better health will not make you content. Because you'll always be worried about, do I have enough? Can I get more? And the principle that we're going to see from Scripture, from what Philippians 4 tells us, is that we should always be content with what we have but never with who we are. See, if you read through the book of Philippians, what you see when you get to chapter 3 is Paul says, I have not yet arrived. I press toward the mark of maturity in Christ. We should always be pressing on to greater maturity, not, in, not being satisfied with who we are. But we do need to be content with what we have because the possessions, the health, the money, the jobs, all of that won't satisfy us. We need to find our satisfaction in God. And that brings us back to our passage again in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, where Paul describes what contentment is and how to become content. It starts out in verse 10 where Paul is thanking the Philippians for a, an offering that they had collected and they had sent to Paul to meet his needs. But Paul wants them to understand it. Well, it, it, while I appreciate the gift, it doesn't change my outlook on life because I was content with the gift. I was content without the gift. And what Paul starts to say in verse 11 is that contentment is something that we learn. In verse 11, the second part of the verse, Paul says, I have learned to be content. Now the word that he uses there for learned is a significant word. It's the idea of learning by experience. If you wanted to learn about the great outdoors, you could read about it in a book, you could read the National Geographic magazine, or you could actually go hiking. If you wanted to learn about the history of New England, about what took place at Lexington and Concord. You could read about it in all kinds of history books, or you could actually go to Lexington and Concord and, and walk the, uh, the paths that the Minutemen walked and see firsthand the what and the when and the where. If you wanted to learn about how to drive a car. You might take a class, you might read the, the handbook produced by the RMV, but you also need to get behind the wheel and learn by experience. And that's what Paul says, I've learned to be content. I learned by experience to be content. I didn't read about it in the New Testament. I went through life and learned what it meant. The second thing that Paul describes is that he learned by experience and his experience was in the extremes of life. Again, look at what Paul says in verses 11 and 12. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Well, that's pretty broad. That's pretty general. Now Paul gets pretty specific about what those situations look like. I know how to be brought low. I know about how to be humbled. I know how to abound, how to be exalted. In any and every situation, every and in any circumstance, I know how to face plenty. I know how to experience hunger. I know what it's like to sit down before the seven course meal the, the Mother's Day buffet, the brunch. But I also know how to miss a few meals, how to go hungry. I know what it's like to experience abundance, to have more than enough. But I also know what it's like to, 
to be in need. And what Paul says is, I have learned in the extremes of life that if I have more, if I have less, if I have abundance, if I have poverty, if I am well-fed, if I am hungry, I've learned how to say, it's enough. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. In his uh, commentary on the book of Philippians, Chuck Swindoll put it this way. Balanced as he was, Paul equally enjoyed hot dogs or a filet mignon, a velvet cushioned chariot Seville or a dirty burrow with a limp. Paul knew what it was like to go through the extremes and he learned to be content in anything and everything. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, I have learned the secret. I've learned the secret of contentment. See, the reality is contentment is not something that the average person understands, what they, what they experience, because contentment's a secret. And the word that he uses for secret is mystery. It's the idea of initiation. It's the idea of joining a fraternity and learning the secret handshake, the, the code word to get in the door. And that's what Paul says, is that contentment is a secret. The average person doesn't understand it. And you think, well, well, what's the secret? Well, part of it is that contentment is a process. It is learned over time. You don't merely say today, okay, I want, I want to be content. And you flip a switch this afternoon and tomorrow morning you're content. No, you got you to go through some days, some weeks, some months, some experiences, some highs, some lows. And over time you learn to be content because it, it's a process that takes place over time. Contentment also comes through subtracted desires. Because oftentimes we have the idea, well, if I just get enough, I'll be content. The reality is that it's the opposite of that. It requires the discipline of saying, I don't need that. Yeah, it would be nice. I, I might want it, but I don't need it. It's not essential to my happiness. This is where the Stoics had the right idea, where they said that if you want to make a man happy, add not to his possessions, but take away from his desires. Socrates was once asked, who is the wealthiest man? And he answered, he was content with the least, for contentment is nature's wealth. The true secret is found in verse 13, that contentment comes through God's strength through the ability that God provides. Where in verse 13, Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now this is one of several verses in the Bible that is very misused, misquoted, and misapplied. You'll find this verse in the weight room of a gymnasium. Where somebody says, I can bench 500 pounds through the strength that God gives. I can run the Boston Marathon through the strength that God gives. I can walk into an airport and I can fly a plane without going to flight school if God gives me the strength. That is not what this verse means. Look at the context. What's the context here? What is Paul talking about? Paul is talking about being content in any and every situation. In verse 13, where Paul says, I can do all things, the all things is being content in abundance and need, in plenty and in want. Being content in any and every situation through the strength that God gives. That's what this verse means is not that I can run faster than a speeding locomotive, that I can leap tall buildings with a single bound. That's taking it out of context. 
The context is that I can learn to be content because God gives me the strength. The uh, late Greek scholar, Kenneth Wiest, in his book, Word Studies in the Greek New Testament, translated the verse this way. I am strong for all things in the one who constantly infuses strength in me. And the word that Paul uses here for strength is the idea of infusion. It is the idea of not that you, you take a pill and you are suddenly strong, that you go on steroids and now you're, you're, you're buffed up and you're strong, but it's the idea of infusion. It's the idea of a, an IV drip, infusing medicine into your body. It's the idea of putting a tea bag in hot water and seeing the tea seep into the water and transform it. That's why we say that contentment is a process. As God gives me strength now, and in five minutes, and in an hour, and tomorrow, and next week, and God infuses his strength in me and helps me learn to be content. See, contentment is supernatural. And that's why we say it's a secret, that the average person doesn't know it. Because contentment is a miracle that God produces in our lives as we trust him, as we rely on him. If you compare and contrast Stoicism with Christianity, what you discover is that the Stoics said, I will learn contentment by a deliberate act of my will. I will produce contentment. Where Christianity says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. The Stoics saw contentment as a human achievement. I can do this. Where Christianity sees contentment as a divine gift. It's a gift of God through God's strength. The Stoics said contentment was being self-sufficient, where Christianity says that contentment is being God-dependent, depending on God for strength to be able to say it's enough. As you think about this idea, as I thought about my own life and look back over the the uh, 65 years of my life, my 35 years in ministry, I've learned to be content. I have been employed. I've been unemployed for six months at a time. I have had long hair and a beard. I have lost all my hair due to illness and stress. I have been healthy. I've been in the hospital for two weeks with a broken leg. I have been loved, I have been criticized. I have been affirmed by churches, I have been fired by churches. And through it all, I have learned to be content through the strength that God provides. As you think about your own life and how to put this into practice this week, let me encourage you to start by asking a question. Ask yourself, what areas of my life Am I discontent with? Now you may be saying, well, hey, I'm, I'm completely satisfied. I'm not discontent with anything. Well, look for three clues to find out where you're discontent. What do you complain about? What do you covet? What do you want? I've got to have it. I didn't even know it existed yesterday, but today I have to have it. What do you spend your time wishing for? Oh man, if only I had Aladdin's lamp and I had three wishes. Well, those three things will tell you what you're discontent with. Well, the second question is, ask yourself, what can I do to change things? Because if there's something you can do, then do it. If you can make a change in your life and your circumstances, then make that change. But if you can't, change, if the circumstances are beyond your control, then ask God for the strength to say, it's enough. I'll be satisfied. Don't say, Lord, you change my circumstances and then I'll be content. 
No, it's completely opposite of that. Ask God to say, God, help me to be content regardless of my circumstances. See, what the scriptures present is that we should be content with what we have, with our resources, with our money, with our health, with our jobs, with our families. But we should never be content with who we are. We should strive for greater growth, to have a deeper, more abiding walk with Christ. We should strive to be content in our attitudes and our actions. To be content with what you have, but not with who you are. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that the scriptures speak to the very details of our lives. Father, I pray that you would work in each one of our hearts, that you would transform us, that you would give us the grace and the strength that we need to be able to say it's enough, to be satisfied with what it is that you provide for us. Father, thank you so much for your great love. I pray that you would work in us, that you would work through us, that you would transform us. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, amen.